right. The frontline worker recording in progress. Working group is uh, about to begin. It is August 10th at 12 o'clock. Um, we have an agenda here in front of us, and first thing on the agenda is, and we do have a quorum, is to approve the August 5th minutes. Uh, Representative Winkler, can you make a motion to approve the minutes? Madam Chair, I move approval of the minutes of August 5th. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. The meeting's minutes of August 5th are approved. Um, Second on the agenda was the overview from the Louisiana Frontline Workers Rebate Program, and I'm very interested in, in hearing from them, but they had a conflict today, so they will be next Tuesday. Um, they will be presenting what they're doing down there in Louisiana, so we will hear from them next Tuesday. Um, first on the agenda is the impact on hospital workers. We have got uh, Mary Crinky from the Minnesota Hospital Association live here in person, and the rest of our testimony is going to be on Zoom today. Uh, Ms. Krinky, welcome to the committee. State your name for the recording, and welcome. Super. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair, Mr. Chair, and members of the working group, for the record, my name is Mary Crinky, and I'm with the Minnesota Hospital Association. Uh, thank you for this opportunity today to share what I think is some very important information about our frontline caregivers. I truly believe the work you are doing now is more important than I really thought it was even going to be a month ago. We are now in, regretfully, surge number four, and our frontline workers, I think uh, a few weeks ago, they were seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, and now I think there really is sort of desperation, and they are exhausted. And I, I, I'm not saying that, overstating that. Our staffs are really tired right now. They've been working really hard for over a year, year and a half. And it has become more complicated because of the labor shortages that are out there. And you heard that last week from our long-term care workers as well, is that they're facing the same sort of um, crisis in, in staffing shortages. I think a payment to our frontline healthcare workers at this time, while it's not gonna solve all those workforce challenges, I think it will be a big morale booster, and I do think it will help show our appreciation for the work that they are doing. It's okay. Um, I know several of the work group members have suggested that the $250 million may not be enough money to include all of our essential workers, and that may be indeed the case, but I hope that at this point in time we can prioritize our health care workers who have been on the front line. And if you look at the language and the instructions from the legislation, it does say to include workers who have increased risk of virus exposure due to the nature of their work. And that clearly, we believe, has to include our hospital workers who have been both public facing and those that are dealing with direct patient care. I remind everyone that it's a 24 hour a day job, seven days a week, 365 days a year. There is no break. Let me describe quickly what our care teams do. It involves our nurses, our nursing assistants, our physicians, our care teams, our environmental cleaning staff, and a lot of healthcare professionals. And unlike other workers, they have to lean into the patient. There is no social distancing involved. Um, they have to help our patients breathe, feed, turn them continually. We learned during COVID that if patients were laying on their stomach in a prone position, it cleared their lungs. So part of caring for COVID patients is constantly turning them and moving them. This is a hands-on job with direct contact with the patient. Um, it's tireless and selfless, and we just really think it's important that they're included in this frontline worker pay. As of last Friday, 33,578 individuals with COVID have been cared for in our hospitals, of which 6,808 were in the ICU units. Um, I would like to share now some specific salary information with you all and some specific numbers. I know that's what this work group needs to do. Um, Hospital staffing is complicated, okay? It is not like many other sectors of our economy. We have lots and lots of different types of employees. It's complicated. Altogether, we employ 125,000 individuals. 
We have pulled from the information for you all today, we have pulled out physicians, and that doesn't mean that they weren't at risk, but the other criteria in the bill language says financial burden. So we have pulled out our physician staff. We have also pulled out our management staff, and we have pulled out our administrative staff, those who do the billing and could potentially have worked from home. So the information that we have for you today is regarding our frontline caregivers. Now, if you look on the sheet that I just passed out to, to you all, um, I can see some of you all are looking for it. Um, I'm, I gave it to the committee. I'll just wait here, because I think it would help to see it. And I will send this to the committee for um, their information. So. Mary, could you just hold it up to ensure that we have the right document? Are you able to do that? Sure. Okay, does everybody have it? Thank you. Okay, so this may appear a little confusing, so I want to just go through this a little bit here. The, the information above the black line is information that is reported, is information that is reported to the state of Minnesota in an annual, what is called the hospital annual report, and it is part of a mandate law that has been in place since 1984. So for the last 37 years, hospitals have been publicly reporting this information. It is required by law that we report this information. It is also includes our state operated facilities. They are required by law to report this information. I feel very confident about this information above the black line. Our members have been doing this type of reporting for many years. The state, if you can believe this, has 45 pages of instructions. <laughs> Um, and so we've been doing this for some time, and it's kind of drilled into what we report. Um, and so I'm going to go through this first, and then I'll get to the information below the black line. So these are what's called direct care jobs. We have registered nurses, licensed practical nurses, nursing assistants, our CNAs, and other allied health support staff. The other health, allied health support staff includes our physical therapists, occupational therapists, lab, imaging, um, and other patient specialists. Now, we have all of the salary information for those categories. And what we did is we broke it down into five buckets. Um, and if you, we took the employee salary information from bucket number one, and if you were in bucket number one, then you're automatically in bucket number two. Buckets one and two are included in bucket number three. Buckets one, two, three, and are included in bucket four, and then bucket five, the last bucket, is a sum total of all the previous buckets. So let me just give you two examples of this. So we have 89 registered nurses who make less than $60,000 a year. These are probably nurses that are just starting in their job, maybe new college graduates, um, and they're new on the job. Then if you go up to 75,000, we have 611 nurses at that salary level. That would include the 89 from the previous bucket. Then if you go up to 90,000, we have 7,000 nurses. And if you go up to 125,000, you add an additional 33,000 nurses going up to 40,000 nurses. So you can see hospitals employ a lot of nurses. Um, then you can go down to licensed practical nurses, and it caps out at $60,000. So none of our licensed practical nurses make more than $60,000. You can see the cap there. Of our nursing assistants, you can see the cap there at um, the 60,000. And the allied health professionals, you can see the cap at the 90,000. So each of the buckets get larger. This information includes both full-time and part-time workers. So you all could make a distinction between full and part-time workers. But this is the way we are required to report it to the state, okay? So I just, I just want to say I feel fairly confident about this information because it's, it's information that we've been reporting for a long time, okay? Now the information below the black line. This is information that we have surveyed on in the last two weeks. So there was no mandate that all hospitals report this to us. So 
We got information from a large number of our members, to be clear, but we extrapolated based on bed size for similar hospitals. So I want to put the caveat there that this information is not quite as precise. We, we, it, it's a good faith estimate. So what we did, we have 78 critical access hospitals in Minnesota. These are hospitals that have less than 25 beds. We heard from about 30 of those hospitals. So we took their information from the 30 hospitals and we said the other 48 hospitals would be similar. And we did the same thing for our large hospitals. So I want to be clear, this information has a little bit more um, for lack of a good term, fudge factor in it, okay? So we, I, the dietary services, the environmental cleaning services, plant maintenance is a little different than an environmental cleaning. These are individuals who maybe work on our HVAC systems, electrical systems. Some of them may even have a college uh, engineering degree. So a little higher level than um, the environmental cleaning services. This new category uh, is a new category of employee that I was not familiar with, patient access specialists. And this number, to be honest, seemed a little high to me. I was really surprised that we had that many people. This are, these are the employees that monitor and guide patient and guest traffic in the hospital now with COVID. So you have to keep patients who are COVID patients in the COVID areas and patients that are non-COVID patients out of the COVID areas, and they are monitoring patient flow and traffic of both our guests and visitors. I believe that that number may be a little high because of turnover. So we asked our members to say how many they had, and that might have been over the course of the year. So a question to ask this group to determine is this payment only going to current employees or are you asking employers to go back and look at who may have worked in the past year? So I, that, that's a question that if you're seeking data from us, we may need an answer to in terms of direction on that. Um, is this to go to past workers or just current workers? The next one I want to highlight is a little strange as well, and that is the ambulance first responders. We believe this number reflects the ambulance workers that are hospital employees. There are many ambulance workers who work for private ambulance companies. My suggestion would be to talk to the Minnesota Ambulance Association and get their industry numbers and then take this number out of the hospital bucket, okay? But I wanted to make sure that you all knew hospitals do employ EMTs and ambulance workers, but there are also independent ambulance companies. So now these last three are also a question of, I included it, but I, I just want you all to know that many of our hospitals have affiliated clinics. So you know the big hospital systems that have clinics. So I included their employment numbers as well. And you can see the number of clinic-based RNs, the number of clinic-based certified medical assistants, and clinic-based LPNs. I would like to just add one comment here, that those clinic-based RNs were the individuals who did most of the drive-up testing for COVID around the state. So a really important role. It seems so long ago now, now that we have vaccines, but early on, those drive-up testing sites were so important to how we stopped the spread from getting worse. So I, I think there's a strong case to be made that those clinic nurses that did the drive-up testing were really part of our COVID response. So I, I included those numbers as well. And um, I, like I said, I, I want you all to know that the numbers be below the black line have a little bit of estimating because we did not hear from 100% of our members. Um, I know this is a lot of information and I, I want you all to know we stand ready to help however we can providing with you with the information. We can break down salary, 
we can break down full-time, part-time, but I at least wanted to give you all a sampling. It is far more confusing than many of the other employment sectors just because of the diversity of the type. We have lots of different job categories. So I recognize that if both of these buckets were put together, it's about 100,000, 111,000 employees. So it's, it's quite a bit. So Madam Chair, I stand for questions and, and really appreciate your time and your attention and want to know we want to help however we can. Thank you so much, Ms. Krinke. This is, uh, this is great data. This is exactly what we were looking for. So thank you very much. One, um, uh, the, on the below the black line in the COVID-19 screeners, um, I don't know if, if that got missed or I missed it. Can you explain what they are? Yeah. Um, early on during, during COVID, um, we did temperature checks of, of our employees as they came in. We screened employees. We screened all visitors. We had people that were public facing that um, were part of our um, I, team that decided who really came in and out of the hospital. So they did have public facing as, uh, as they were screening people to come in. They also, a lot of them assisted the nurses with the uh, testing. They weren't the ones doing the, doing the shots was usually an LPN or an RN, but I, if you did one of those drive up testing, they were people that did the screening and the paperwork, so they did have some public facing. They weren't actually doing the, vac the testing, but they assisted. Thank you. So were these new people that were hired or were they already working somewhere else in the hospital and got moved over? That's a very good question. Um, and that is something that gets to sort of the definitions of how below the black line did hospitals repurpose some of their, um, did they repurpose some of their nursing aides to serve in those roles? and. And I need to do some follow-up. I think that that's a really good question that you're asking me that we need to do follow-up on. Were some of these employees repurposed below the black line? Right, yes, thanks. Yeah, because I'm wondering if they're getting double counted, yep. if they're counted yep. someplace else. Okay, good. Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, again, I appreciate the information. I was stuck in traffic on my way here. There was a huge truck on my way in, but um, fortunately, with all the technology, I was able to listen in on the presentation, so that was helpful. A question I have for you is full-time and part-time. You mentioned that. I think that's a really important um, mm -hmm. distinction, so could you address mm -hmm. how you might handle that? Mm -hmm. Ms. Um, Madam Chair, Mr. Chair, and members of the committee, this is probably, I think, one of our biggest challenges with this, with this issue. We have many of our nurses, registered nurses, who work three 12-hour shifts. We consider them full-time. Mm -hmm. They get full-time benefits. We consider our nurses that work 36 hours full-time. So are, how are you all going to define what is a full-time and part-time? Is it 2,080 hours? Did they work 40 hours for the full year? Or are you going to ask the employer how we define full and part-time? So uh, how many hours over the past year do you want to say somebody worked in order to qualify for a hero bonus payment? So like we consider full time being less than 2,080 hours. Other employers consider full time to be 2,080 hours. Thank you, Ms. Krinky. That is something we are gonna have to drill down and follow up. Yeah, Senator thank you. Kimmer. Thank you, Madam Chair. So in regards to that, I would say in general, um, full time, the four hour difference to me doesn't make a big distinction in regards to that full time. Um, part time, I think, is more of a consideration. Is that anything less than or what might that be? What would be considered part time? I, I think when you're looking at thousands, we're not going to be able to get into fine-tuning exactly this or exactly that. I think we want to have an overall kind of a fair approach. Mm -hmm. So could you address some of the part-time? Yes. Um, Ms. Madam Chair, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I would guess, estimate a good guess based on the numbers I've seen, that more than half of our nurses are full-time and maybe a third would be considered part-time. 
Senator Kiffmeyer. Well, that adds up to about 80 percent, so yeah. <laughs> I'm a little bit. What are the others? Uh, casual? The Ms. others would be casual. An occasional shift mm -hmm. or so on. Madam Chair, I do have a, a different kind of question, so if you want to go to somebody else, I'll wait and ask my next question when you have finished with others. Thank you, Senator Kiffmeyer. Representative Winkler. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Kringy, I guess my question goes to the data that you were just describing on full versus part-time, uh, and specifically, you know, may, we may have workers who put in very little time during the pandemic but still appear on a list if we go back to past employees. I assume that, I mean, obviously this data is reported to uh, the unemployment insurance system where they do track hours differently. And I don't know if you can answer this question. I know that Commissioner Doty uh, and Commissioner Grove will be looking at this issue, and maybe Commissioner Grove can address it from a UI standpoint. But I wonder if you have a list of employees, we could, if we could match that with UI or uh, I suppose it would be UI data to determine uh, when individuals worked, uh, how many hours they were working, and so forth, so that we could potentially have a data set that would allow us to set some limits. Ms. Krinke, and then we'll go to Commissioner Grove. Madam Chair and, and, and Chair Winkler, I need to think about that before. That's a really good question, and um, I need to go back, and I'm, I, I'm sorry, at the top of my head, I need to ask our data people, but I probably need to ask our individual health systems how they tracked it. So in my preparing for this committee hearing today, I, I looked at what information the Minnesota Hospital Association tracks, and we don't really track individual ins unemployment insurance claims or the, or the hours like that. So uh, the more specific questions I get from you all, the more specific answers I can provide. That, um, Thank you. Sorry. Um, I, we no. sincerely want to help. I just, no, no, that's Madam a really Chair, hard that's, question. It was, yeah. just, it was a question that occurred to me as we were getting started. I wonder if Commissioner Grove has any insight as to, into that. I, I think Deed and uh, revenue have exchanged this kind of information before, but I'd be curious to get a preview of what that might be. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Grove. Madam Chair, uh, Representative Winkler, it's a great question. We, um, via the UI system, can track uh, hours worked based on employer reports. So whatever the employer has reported to us via the UI system, we can track accordingly. So. We could probably cross-reference that with some of this data. And then to the point on income thresholds, that's probably more of a question for my colleague at the Department of Revenue, but there's, there's, that, um, there's that angle you could take as well if you're trying to think about thresholds. Thank you. Follow-up? No? Nope. Good. Um, Senator Murphy. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Ms. Krinke, uh, for being here today and for sharing the the information which people are very interested in. Uh, and I'm glad for the, the line and what you are indicating is where you have strong confidence in the data and then maybe a little less confidence in the survey information. One thing I will say in the survey information as I look through that is the LPNs should be paid more, but that's not a conversation <laughs> for this table. Um, I, do, uh, I do just have a couple of questions. And the first is, about the information above the black line where you have more confidence and that this is information you've been collected for, collecting for a long time and because you've been directed so, where do, I, where do I find that direction so I can understand what is in this bucket of data that um, you yes. have? It's, um, it's at the Minnesota Department of Health and it is called the Healthcare Cost Information System, commonly referred to as the HCCIS. And um, it's, you can get it from the Minnesota Department of Health, and it's publicly available data. Senator Murphy. Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, thank you, Ms. Krinke. I really appreciate that reminder about where we can find that information. Uh, you raised a question that um, hasn't come before us uh, yet, and that is the question of current employees or past employees. And I'm wondering if you have uh, a perspective about that question while you're here with us today. Ms. Krinke. Madam Chair, members of the committee, where this came up to me um, was when I was looking at the data that our data team presented to me, and I was really surprised to see 5,000 employees 
in patient access specialists. That seemed just high to me in, instinctively. We have really that many people that are directing what I call traffic controllers, for lack of a better term, within the hospital, moving patients around and visitors around. And that number just seemed high to me. So a light bulb went off saying, well, maybe that, because that is an entry-level position, uh, the salary is lower, there's probably more churn in that job than there are with our professional RNs, many of which had been working at the hospital for 20 years. And so I just, I questioned the data under the, the patient access specialist, 5,000 seem high to me. That's why I thought, well, maybe that was a number that they reported thinking that's how many different individuals they had over the course of the year. So I'm showing the flaws in our own data, but it's, it was a survey and different people answer surveys differently. And so I need to go back on that one. Mm. No, so. Thank you, Senator Murphy, follow up? Just one more, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Ms. Krinky. I appreciate that that helps me understand uh, sort of the foundation of the question. Um, and it also takes me to the last, the last issue you raised, which is about workforce. Um, and uh, we are reading now a lot across the country, especially as uh, we're seeing severe surges in Florida and Texas um, that the people who have been working in hospitals, people who have been working in schools are departing from their, their jobs. And we're, we're experiencing that here as well. And so I, I think that there's gonna be a constant tension in the work that we're doing here about the workforce for our future um, and the experiences that um, frontline workers have had and wanting to make sure that we are recognizing the important work of frontline workers, knowing that we can't probably solve the workforce issue going forward um, in this moment, um, but that we have that work to do together. Yeah. Yeah. Madam Chair, Ms. Green. I really appreciate your comments, Senator Murphy. I think our workers right now could really use an emotional boost and just the recognition from the state. Thank you for your work and your service. And I, like I said, a month ago, I thought we were at the light at the end of the tunnel and now we're in surge number four. And they're, they're tired, they're tired, so. Thank you. Bye. Um, Senator Kiffmeyer. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So I, one of the things I, I was struck as I heard about the, the nurses and what they do, and there are just so many people who stepped up in so many ways uh, to be helpful. But I remember when I heard the Prime Minister of England, when he called out in particular the nurse who was with him. I know he expressed appreciation to everybody, physicians and everybody, but nurses are off the ones that are right there uh, literally um, and in your room and in a very personal way taking care of you. So I, I think uh, whether it's a nursing home, again, those very direct, very personal, but I just thought it was interesting that he called out his nurse. Um, the question that I have for you has to do with, um, I think it's important to um, consider um, in your particular situation, I'm not sure, and by the way, um, nurses, doctors, and these sorts of people, first responders, these are people who have a unique kind of calling to help. And they do it oftentimes, and this is not just during COVID, there are many times where there are contagious issues or other kinds of dangers, and they step into it to be helpful. It's just like it's a drive within them to do that. And I think I appreciated the comment about expressing our thankfulness, and in no way can it ever fully compensate for the risk or other things that they took. It's, it's really much um, establishing that appreciation and doing that, doing what we can. Um, one of the questions I have though, did any hospital systems or anything like that do, in some other states they've called it um, extra hazard pay or on top of the per hour in recognizing their unique situation? Was there anything like that done in, within the hospital um, systems? Ms. Madam Frankie. Chair and, and Senator Kiffmeyer, we have heard of a number of our hospitals that provided bonuses. Um, we know of a number of our hospitals. One hospital did a PTO bank where um, hospital employees donated PTO so that uh, nurses could take additional PTO time off. Um, bonuses were paid, but 
I didn't keep, I don't have a tracking system of that regarding which hospitals have done what. Um, so I, I, I'm not answering your question. You know, I can't tell okay. you how many of our hospitals paid extra, how many of our hospitals did extra. Um, and, and maybe that's something we should try to collect. Uh, but a number of hospitals have done things individually to to help out their staffs across the board, not just the nurses, but all their employees. So. Senator Kiffmeyer. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. In regards to some of this PTO, it's basically one nurse <laughs> paying for another nurse to have time off. It didn't come from the hospital, didn't come from the state of Minnesota. It came from them, again, from that heart of helpfulness uh, to do that for each other. I don't think that's you know, a relevant thing here. But I think um, I'm not sure at going through the effort of collecting that right now. I, I just am asking the question uh, to maybe give that some thought. But other than that, um, the other thing I think was uh, your question about the, the helpfulness of this particular group that you thought might be a large number and might have had more turnover and so the actual global number might be affected. How would you approach that? How would you kind of sort out that data by maybe how long employed or something like that? Yeah. Ms. Crinky. Madam Chair and members of the committee, um, a couple questions that we would have is do you want the the payments to go to current employees. That would perhaps limit this as opposed to people who've worked in the past mm -hmm. year. Um, working with DEED, and I appreciated uh, the commissioner's comments, they have the number of hours information, so maybe there is a, a cutoff regarding the number of hours that somebody put in. Um, and, and many of our nurses are being asked to work overtime too, so they're they're going to have probably plenty of hours. But it does get to what is the start and what is the end? Um, are you starting this last July? Or are you starting it last March? What is the time frame for when that clock starts in terms of the hours that they've worked? How far back do we go? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and on some of these, we can, you know, we can resurvey and maybe provide a tighter definition so that people are answering it more similarly. That's one of the things that, that when you're doing a survey for the first time, you learn as you do survey work, and those of you all who do survey work, once you do survey work over and over again, you get the questions with more precision to get more for what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. That's Same. all, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have Representative Frazier, and then we'll go to Commissioner Doty after that. Representative Frazier. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Grinke, thank you for the information you provided so far. I appreciate that. Uh, just in terms, and I'll, I'll get to my question, but just in terms of the recognizing the sacrifices of our nurses um, and, and any of our hospital workers or frontline workers that were there, um, I know Senator Housley, um, she, she mentioned that some of the information may not be relevant or may not be helpful in the situation. Um, but I do think it would be it would be helpful, and this may be a long term thing as we're talking about how do we solve the issue of workforce issues and just having the uh, the lack of staff that we need to continue on, considering that we're still in this pandemic. I think it would be helpful to know which hospitals um, either provided a program for a PTO that they provided themselves, and it wasn't a bank that required other nurses to share their PTO, um, and which ones are those that exempted themselves to not provide those resources. Um, to where the government uh, would, would uh, gave resources um, or allowed for the exemption from particular programs during the height of the pandemic. I know we're going into another surge, but that first initial surge when we were there. And I think it's important to have that information because I do think it can help us as we're moving forward to serve the, the workforce uh, issue. I mean, for employees and um, workers, uh, I know it's always important to know where your employer stands in times of crises and how they recognize and appreciate the work of the workers that make those businesses continue to go. So I think that information would absolutely be helpful as we kind of move forward. And it could also be helpful in the situation here as we're determining who gets what and how much. Yeah. So if you could speak to that a bit, I'd appreciate it. Uh, Madam Chair and, and Representative Frazier, um, 
this is obviously a very difficult conversation, and I do think it's important, and I didn't want to lead with this, but I do think it's important that this past year has been very difficult for hospitals financially. Um, the, the median operating margins for hospitals this last year was 1.4%. It has been dropping steadily for the last couple years, but we did have about a three-month period there where we were not doing any elective or other procedures. We were saving our personal protective equipment for our staffs, and uh, we shut down many services. After that, it took a long time for people willing to come back in. A lot of patients delayed care. So we're, we're coming off of a, a very difficult year. Expenses are up. Services were down. And I'm not I'm not saying it's going to last forever. I, I, I don't want to make it sound like that hospitals are fundamentally structured uh, to, to not have a positive operating margin. But this past year and the last year has been very difficult financially for the hospitals. So I just want to say on record, I, I think while many hospitals would like to do more for their frontline workers, it really hasn't been a possibility. So with that, I just think it's important to get that on the record as well. Thank you. Um, I have a question for um, Representative Frazier. You wanted um, this information to uh, to be able to see who gave those bonuses and who didn't, or is it to see what model they used to give out the bonuses? That's what I was curious about. Well, I, I think it, I think it could be both. Uh, I think it could be both, and I'm not necessarily sure that I would call those bonuses if it was if it was providing uh, leave time or making sure that folks didn't lose their PTO time. I'm not sure I'd call it a bonus, uh, but I would call it a, a, a very um, explicit and uh, a very grateful appreciation of what the workers were doing to make sure that they weren't harmed, at least in that way, during the during the work that they put in at the height of the pandemic. I think it would. I think both of those criteria would be helpful to kind of figure out where we're going and where we're going to land this plane ultimately. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Doty. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, actually, uh, Representative Frazier really kind of asked my question as well. Um, so I appreciate that question. And, and I just want to underscore, though, the importance of, of getting some kind of, some kind of data around um, uh, what bonuses that were received in, in general. Um, I guess I would agree with Representative Frazier that, um, you know, PTO, I wouldn't consider that in the same way for these purposes um, as, you know, other monetary bonuses. I also think it's really important, though, as we are looking across various um, industry sectors, um, you know, we've talked about wanting to be clear about um, how these workers were, um, you know, what they did receive in terms of any other extra compensation or whatever. So as we're looking across the board, I think that in this sector, it's important to do that as well. So if there is information that we could receive, I do think that would be helpful. Thank you. All right. Uh, oh, Representative Winkler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Krinke, I think another way to think about some of these issues is that there also were, uh, I presume, I don't know the details uh, or numbers, but Surely there were people who lost, who worked in these jobs, who lost their lives or had sub suffered long-term health consequences uh, due to the nature of the work that they were doing and their exposure. I don't know what kind of uh, resources are available for survivors of those in those kinds of situations. I presume uh, that workers' compensation and other things are available, but I don't know if that always covers the loss. So we, we also may be in a situation in which certain workers and their families bore an extraordinary cost and were, were terribly damaged because of their service. And I wonder if we should have that as part of the conversation as well, because, um, you know, uh, a lot of people served and they, they were heroes and they were fine. And a lot of people, and I don't know the numbers, but some people made much, much greater sacrifices than that. M Madam Chair and, and Representative Winkler, one of the first pieces of legislation that was passed during the outbreak of COVID was a presumptive eligibility of workers' compensation. And um, the hospitals supported that legislation to include uh, workers to make the assumption that if they were working directly with COVID patients, 
directly with COVID patients, not just working at a hospital setting, because we have a lot of people who work in hospitals who don't work with COVID patients. But if they were working directly with COVID patients, they would have a presumption of eligibility under workers' comp. So I would, I would make the case that that information should come from Dolly and that Dolly should track that information regarding individuals who were harmed on the job and that they would have that information. So um, I, I don't know the answer to that information, and I, I collectively don't have it. So, um, Commissioner Robinson. Madam Chair, members of the committee, uh, labor and industry have been aggressively tracking the um, uh, workers' compensation claims, and we certainly can provide some insight to the committee if we want to do a deeper dive and look at what are the, where the intersections between um, the nurses in particular. I can say that. There are a few trends out there. Um, I can say that hospitals were a bit better in reporting and acknowledging the workers' compensation claims versus in other um, industries. And so I would be happy to make that part of our presentation. I believe I will be presenting to the group next week, Thursday. I can include a strong element that really sort of fill behind the back and look at um, the how workers' compensation fits into the sole equation. So I'd be happy to make that a part of my presentation. Great. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Representative Lincoln. And Madam Chair, to the Commissioner, Sorry. some description of the uh, benefits that people receive as well would be useful um, because I think I don't really know that much about, frankly, uh, how well, families are taken care of after they lose the income of a loved one, and obviously we can't replace them, but there's still a financial cost, and so some understanding of that would also be useful for me. Absolutely. Commissioner Robertson, can you um, flip your uh, microphone on? Yep, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, certainly we can include uh, information, but just, uh, just to give the group a perspective, Workers' compensation um, provides that there is a wage replacement supplement as well as um, uh, coverage of medical costs. So those are the two components, and we can just dive into um, based on the information. We've been tracking it, so we're really in a good position to enlighten the committee and share some good information. I'll be prepared to include that in my presentation next week. That's great. Great question, um, Representative Winkler. Uh, Representative New Brindley has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I apologize, I didn't hear all of the commissioner's comments. Um, the, the microphone was an issue, so I apologize if I, if I um, repeat anything, but I, I want to say I really appreciate Representative Winkler's question, questions and comments on compensation for survivors. Um, I, I, I like to think that many of our, our frontline workers, um, certainly I know our hospitals and long-term care facilities were doing everything they could to keep their um, staff and nurses safe. Um, but certainly we know that there are those who got sick and I'm sure that those, there are those who, who lost their lives. And um, I, I really appreciate remembering that group um, as, we, as we consider this moving forward. So I, I appreciate that, Representative Winkler. Um, I, I, my, my question goes back to PTO and, and it sounds like um, perhaps there were some entities that were able um, to offer additional PTO or made other arrangements with that. Um, certainly, that is a decision that hospitals made, and as Representative Fraser indicated, perhaps that's. And, and I apologize if I if I if I misinterpreted what what you said, Representative Fraser. But it sounds like that's not necessarily something that will be used to determine these payments, but is made maybe just part of the longer or of the larger conversation, I would hate to um, penalize 
individual employees, individual nurses and dietary workers, et cetera, um, for, for po policies of the hospital. And, and likewise, um, you know, we, we haven't necessarily discussed this much in, in committee yet, but, um, you know, there's been discussion about those who had to take a lot of PTO and therefore um, lost those hours for personal time. Um, but I, I would also hate to neglect that group who, um, who were able to stick it out and actually didn't take PTO over the time of the pandemic and, and really sacrificed that personal time that they normally would take with their families and their loved ones, um, but who, who were able to make the decision to stick it out. Obviously, all hands were on deck. Everyone knew that they were needed in these facilities at the time. Um, and so I, I, would, I would hate to um, penalize those folks as well by, by taking that PTO into consideration um, as part of this discussion. Uh, as Representative Frazier indicated, certainly that could be part of a larger discussion. But when we are, when we're talking about who to distribute these hero pay funds for um, and, and how to distribute those, I hope we're not penalizing individuals based on, on what hospitals may have been able to provide or, again, time that they didn't take off. Uh, because they knew how, how desperately they were needed. More of a comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative New Brindley. Uh, members, any other questions? I don't see any hands online, and nobody's here. All right. Thank you, Ms. Krinke. Thank you. And you'll be around in case we have any more questions. We have a lot of testifiers, um, 12 of them. One's here in person. Um, Brianne Bernini from SEIU. Healthcare Minnesota, thanks for coming down. Um, and for you, Ms. Bernini, and the rest of the testifiers, if we could keep the, your testimony to three minutes. All right, thanks. Um, announce yourself for the recording. Thank you, and welcome. Thank you for having me today. My name is Brian Bernini. I live in Plymouth, and I'm an emergency center tech at Methodist Hospital. I'm also an executive board member of my union, SEIU Healthcare Minnesota. The COVID-19 pandemic hit my hospital like a runaway freight train. I remember one week late February, early March, talking to one of the head doctors in the emergency center, asking him if COVID was coming. Is this something that we should be worrying about? And he assured us, no, this is not coming here. It's gonna be fine. We're gonna be okay. Within a week, that completely changed. We had to completely rearrange our hospital Walls were being built, trucks were being brought in. It was just a complete change. We now have correct PPE, but at the start, like many places, we never had enough PPE. For months, I had one N95 respirator. It was meant to be worn once whenever entering a dangerous area. Instead, I had to wear it for my entire 12-hour shift. And at the end of that shift, instead of disposing of the mask, I put it in a paper bag to be sterilized. I would have to wear this mask for 10 days in a row. I was one of the lucky ones. My coworkers in environmental services and other departments had to make do with surgical masks, even when they were entering rooms who had, where a COVID patient had been. Essential workers outside of the hospital had to take risks too, even with less protection than hospital workers. My father, who's over 65 and vulnerable, worked in the grocery store so that all of us could get the food and supplies that we needed. In part, because of the lack of PPE, I was infected with COVID-19 late November, early December. Myself and another coworker were infected by an elderly patient with dementia. She had COVID and kept removing her mask. I then in turn had to quarantine for two weeks. The presumptive workers' compensation law that you passed was the only reason that my quarantine time was paid. I have not gotten a COVID bonus or premium pay from my employer. The hardest part of my COVID quarantine was the time that I lost. When I quarantined, I had to stay in one part of my house away from my husband. 
I knew it was gonna be a long two weeks without seeing him, but I also wanted to make sure he was protected. Before my quarantine ended, my husband passed away suddenly and tragically. COVID took away the last time I would ever have spent, the last two weeks that I would have spent with him. Even now, like so many widows that I seek comfort, the lingering smell of his clothes, anything to bring back the memories of him. I can't smell because COVID took that away from me. I know you can't give me back that time or take away the horrible memories of the fear and terrible, the terror that the hospital workers live through. But a significant bonus to all of us hospital workers would at least show us that our community appreciates the sacrifices we made to protect them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Bernini. I'm so sorry for your loss. That's heartbreaking. Um, thank you for your story and coming here and sharing it with us. And thank you for what you do. Uh, Senator Murphy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you for your testimony. And I echo, uh, I am so sorry for your loss. Um, and grateful that the presumptive eligibility served um, its purpose uh, in your situation. Uh, but I think it's important, and, and we can come back to this when we talk about the data, uh, but there were many that worked in hospitals that didn't qualify for that presumptive eligibility in part because of a lack of effective PPE and testing. Um, so it is not an ironclad uh, figure that we can count on. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Murphy. Um, next up, the testifier, um, Mari Knudsen from Hennepin Healthcare System. I think it's Mari. Did I pronounce it right, Mari? It's Mary. Mary. Mary Knudsen. Did I get the Knudsen right? You did. Okay. Thank you so much for joining the committee. Just state your name again for the recording and then go ahead, proceed. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and members of the work group. My name is Mary Knudsen. I'm a laboratory manager for Hennepin Healthcare System in downtown Minneapolis. As a safety net hospital system, Hennepin Healthcare serves almost 50% Medicaid patients. That means that we get reimbursed far below other healthcare systems, and really we have the least flexibility to make our ends meet. Many of our patients are experiencing housing instability and are more at risk from COVID. We saw the surge early, and despite our challenges, our teams continue to jump in without hesitation each time help is needed. I heard early in the media about the influx of funding from the federal level, but to be really clear, those funds really only kept our lights on and our doors open. Our health system did what they could to support us by holding lower paid positions from furloughs, providing other support where they could, but many of my colleagues and I took pay cuts or furloughs in 2020, and our merit increases and other incentives were canceled in 2021, so we could get by in an already extremely challenging budget situation. I frankly don't see that improving as we start our preparation for the 2022 budget. I've heard about the amazing words of doctors and nurses, and so have you, but I want you to know about the rest of the village that you don't often see in the healthcare system. That village includes those food service workers, the environmental service workers, the blood drawers, the EKG techs, the security personnel, and the list goes on and on and on. Many of those villagers start their careers at less than $17 an hour, and their sacrifices over the last year are heart-wrenching. Let me tell you about one of my own staff. His name is Randy. Randy is a laboratory worker that stepped up to uh, change work last year when th the call happened. Um, our hospital census was high. We had lots of COVID patients. He volunteered to leave the laboratory to help with EKGs on our inpatient unit. He's a single dad. He, he lived with his three-year-old and his six-year-old and he moved them out of his home to live with his parents because he was scared and he didn't want to expose them to COVID. He was asked by his landlord to no longer use their shared kitchen. And so he had to buy his own refrigerator, his own appliances, his own oven. He spent his evenings here at HCMC going from patient room to patient room, caring for patients doing EKGs. That's not something you can do working from home. It's not something you can do being socially distanced. You have to do that by touching patients and taking care of them. So he put himself at risk. And for months, he kept himself segregated from his three-year-old and six-year-old and from his parents. 
so we could make sure they were safe and to make sure our parents had the care that they needed, our patients had the care that they needed. He told me once, it's really hard to explain to my three-year-old why she can't get close enough to give me a hug. Randy's story isn't unique. He, so, he and so many other villagers are here every day to help care for the patients in our healthcare setting. There are so many diverse deserving people that you've heard about to, that they've worked their hearts out through the pandemic, grocery stores, childcare centers, meat packing plants and more. I thank you for this really difficult decision and I, I don't know how you're gonna do it, um, but I really request that you consider the often hidden but broad village of healthcare workers in our healthcare systems as part of the frontline response. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary, for testifying and for your story. Thank you. Um, next up, we have Deb Pavlika, a nurse at Boynton Health Services at the University of Minnesota. Deb, there you are. Um, state your name for the recording and go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair and working group members. My name is Deb Pavlika. I am the president of AFSME Healthcare Local 3260 at the University of Minnesota. I am a nurse at Boynton Health. I am an essential worker. I never wanted to be an essential worker. I've had no choice but to risk my life. We were all mandated to go to work by our elected officials. Boynton Health never closed, not even for a day. All essential workers had to adapt. Everything we knew changed. We put our lives and the lives of our families at risk. In March 2020, I began to live my life believing I was inevitably going to die from COVID. To me, being an essential worker represents sacrifice, fear, stress, anxiety, depression, insomnia, loneliness, helplessness, feeling so vulnerable. I have had endless terrifying nightmares, nightmares of my own death, not being able to say goodbye to my children and my grandchildren, feeling so hopelessly frightened. One of my roles since the beginning of the pandemic in full PPE from head to toe, including a PAPR, which is a personal air, purifi air purification respirator, a big bubble on my head with filtered air being pumped in, taking care of so many with COVID. We were a Minnesota Department of Health designated COVID testing site, day after day administering COVID tests, all of which put us in direct contact with thousands of patients with COVID symptoms. I would get notified every time of the, any tests that I administered that came back positive. And at times that was more than a dozen a day. When the number of cases were at their highest, I always got notified and could not get out of the incubation period before being notified of more positive tests. We are still swabbing symptomatic patients for COVID daily. School will start in a couple of weeks with thousands of students and staff returning in person and the COVID Delta variant is surging. The pandemic is surely not over. All essential workers should be compensated equitably. We were all expected and forced to risk our lives. All of us were there in the essential workers who kept this state viable. We were all there for your mothers, fathers, siblings, grandfathers, neighbors, and children who became ill or needed COVID testing. None of us should be left out of the frontline essential workers pay. We all play a highly significant role in the pandemic. We are not more important than long-term care nor, or hospital workers, nor are we less important either. Clinical nursing staff, healthcare providers, dental assistants, laboratory technicians, admissions clerks, radiology technicians, building services, janitorial personnel. How could so many workers that are essential be so quickly forgotten. Please make our sacrifices matter. We are so very tired. The pandemic is not over. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Pavlika. Uh, thank you for your testimony and thank you for what you do. Um, next up, we have Dr. Carolyn Oglin, Chief Medical Officer at North Memorial. Welcome to the committee, Carolyn. State your name for the record. Thank you. My name is Carolyn Oglin, Madam Chairman and committee members. I am the Chief Medical Officer at North Memorial Health. As most of you know, North Memorial Health is a, is a health system with physical locations located throughout the West and Northwest with two hospitals and an extensive uh, medical ambulance and um, air ambulance. 
We serve a great part of the metro area and around the metro area. Our system cares for a very, very diverse patient population and at many times cared for a significant portion of the patients who had COVID who were hospitalized. Today, we are again on a surge. And today, we at North Memorial are taking care of 19% of the hospitalized Metro COVID patients. We want to thank you uh, for your service in this working group and your time and attention to our essential workers in hospitals and other healthcare systems. I don't envy your position in having to weigh against all the stories and try to make a decision. We know you have limited resources. Throughout this pandemic, though, our entire healthcare system stepped up to the plate. They knew they were going to interact with COVID positive patients or potential COVID positive patients, but they continued to be present and step up for our community. They are continuing to be present and stepping up to our community today. Um, they have significant challenges. We are over 18 months into the pandemic and they are tired, as some of my other colleagues on this call have said. Um, and they really do need to be recognized for their, their efforts and their work. As a system, we have faced unforeseen and evolving challenges out throughout this last year and a half. No one could have predicted that today we would still be in a pandemic. For example, at the beginning of the pandemic, we had a breakdown in supply chain, as everyone knows. Our experience at North was no different than any of my colleagues on this call. We do think, I do think it's important, though, to remind the committee members to understand that we had to monitor and do monitor today gloves, gowns, masks, face shields, and other PPE supplies, including the stock we have on hand, the rate of utilization, and expected deliveries of, of oncoming stock. We have to be in compliant with federal and state regulations, which change quite frequently. All of us have altered our PPE policies many times along the way to adhere to these policies trying to balance the need for supplies and is getting as much PPE as we could in front of our front lines as, as possible. We had to be creative about our, our reuse possible and we had to be creative about disinfecting, um, going above and beyond additional supplies where our own financial outlook and survival was it sometimes compromised. The entire healthcare system stepped up. I can't emphasize this enough. Whether you were at the bedside, whether you're in urgent care ER, in the clinics, whether you were cleaning up the rooms, delivering food, the entire team stepped up. What they saw and what they witnessed is unprecedented, like any other time in the delivery of healthcare for our frontline workers. We are asking for consideration um, for the funds that you are uh, faced with um, determining who gets. I do want to end though, throughout this experience, we've grown stronger as an organization and as a healthcare industry, but our, our frontline workers are tired. Um, and while the essential bonus does not solve all of the ongoing challenges our community is facing, it does provide our healthcare workers with well-earned recognition from our government leaders, which I think everyone agree they deserve. Thank you for your time today and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Oglund, and thank you for your testimony and for what you do. And it is, it's a common theme. You're all tired. Uh, and thank you for keep on keeping on. Um, next up, we've got Jean Foreman um, from the Minnesota Nurses Association. Welcome to the committee, Jean, and state your name for the record. Hello. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chairwoman. I want to thank everyone, actually, for this opportunity to present some regard remarks regarding my experiences as a frontline worker last year. My name is Jean Foreman, and I am a registered nurse, <clears throat> excuse me, now newly retired from Abbott Northwestern Hospital in Minneapolis. I can offer some insights both as a direct caregiver and as a bargaining unit leader for the Minnesota Nurses Association. As you remember, the world changed drastically in March of 2020 as the pandemic began, but it has changed so much since. It's easy to forget now, but at the start of the pandemic, we were all scared. We didn't know how long the virus would be with us, how easily it could be spread, and what long-term effects might be. At the start of the pandemic, we didn't know those things, but what we did know is that we were unprepared. Quite frankly, as an employee at an organization that is supposed to be a responder to disasters, I felt we were woefully unprepared to keep patients safe and unable to keep employees safe. I often heard um, from leaders that we are building this car as we drive it. 
Last year, I worked in the surgery area as a pre-op and post-op nurse, working with patients as they entered and exited surgery. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, we were advised to wear a mask, but we were only given one paper surgical mask and instructed to keep it until it was no longer wearable. So during breaks, we left our masks on a table in the hallway, and at the end of our shift, we would store our mask in our locker to be reused the next time we worked. New masks were locked in the manager's office. I, and again, for context, and this was uh, um, commented on earlier, before COVID, all masks were single use. Put it on and take it off and dispose of it after you had exited the patient room. And in some cases, I can say that before COVID, I might go through multiple masks in a shift, especially when I worked in the ICU. With the new rules, I did not feel safe continually reusing a mask each day until it was no longer wearable. Uh, despite having to reuse masks over and over, storing them in paper bags and hoping that the mask didn't break or fall apart while I was wearing it, we were told by our administration that outside masks were not allowed and that included donated masks that were, you probably recall, were part of mask drives to get supplies to frontline workers. We were not allowed to use those. Um, as a union steward, unfortunately, I was privy to a number of disciplinary actions that were taken against nurses for breaking this rule. We were terrified for ourselves, our patients, and our families. In our profession, we are ruled by the precautionary principle. Uh, meaning that we protect uh, at, at the highest level. For example, we protect patients against falls, not just because they have fallen, but because they might fall. We protect against infection, not because we know there's an infection, but because universal precautions protect us from potential infections to keep us safe and to keep our patients safe. For much of the pandemic, nurses were unable to execute the precautionary principle due to lack of supplies, resources, and staff. Last spring, I had my own very brief exposure to a positive COVID patient because systems were not in place to flag positive COVID results as a priority um, result, you know? Um, for in my uh, circumstances, I went into a patient's room and then it occurred to me that I did not know if the patient had had a COVID test when I looked, I found the result was approximately 24 hours old and it was positive. And when I notified the surgeon and anesthesia of a positive COVID patient, uh, the anesthesiologist actually came to the area in full hazmat garb. And that scared me because I was in the room with a days old paper mask over my mouth and nose and flimsy plastic glasses over my eyes. The infection nurse manager that reviewed the situation with me said that if she had a magic wand, uh, that things would be better. Um, but as a nurse, I know that magic is not what's needed, but rather use of the precautionary principle and true leadership from our managers. I also want to be very blunt with you about my retirement. At the start of my testimony, I, I mentioned that I am newly retired. I can tell you I have loved, loved my career as a nurse. I got into nursing to help people, but I opted for early retirement as I felt in my life, the stress, the lack of support at work and the constantly changing rules at work was not good for me and was not good for my family. I was constantly worried about bringing COVID into my home. I am so grateful that I had the option to retire early thanks to my union contract. Many nurses that I know are still carrying horrors of last year and are very afraid for this upcoming year. I ask that you carefully consider how much was expected from the nursing staff, how they carried out not just nursing duties, but also comforted dying patients, held iPads for remote family meetings, cleaned rooms, and again, so many more untold actions. This pandemic isn't over and our work as nurses continues. It's time to respect that work that is still going on and recognize that hero isn't the compensation we're looking for. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Ms. Foreman, and uh, thanks for, for uh, continuing to do what you did, and I hope you're enjoying your retirement. Good, thank you.
Um, next up, we have uh, Mr. Daniel Clute on, on RN with the Minnesota Nurses Association. Go ahead, Mr. Clute. Hello. Thank you for um, the opportunity to speak today. My name is Daniel Clute. I'm a nurse uh, over at St. Joe's Hospital. I'm an MA co chair at that site. I was recently appoint appointed to the board of directors with MA. Uh, I'm here today in my capacity as a registered nurse who had the opportunity to work at the um, staged all COVID-19 hospital, uh, staged at Bethesda Hospital in St. Paul. I worked there uh, previously before it became a COVID hospital and was there for the whole duration of that until it closed in October and uh, portions of it moved to St. Joe's Hospital where I continued doing COVID work until June of this year. Um, and so I, so like my coworkers and I being part of that process from the outset, outset, we got the opportunity to experience a really wide range of work environments. Um, in, in from the very beginning, but before we even had uh, mask mandates in the hospital, before we realized we all needed the staff to be wearing N95 masks while doing patient care. Uh, along the way, we sort of felt like guinea pigs with infectious disease policies changing um, on a daily basis. There were times when an infectious disease policy or hospital policies were being updated in real time and would would be one thing in the morning and then later in the afternoon it was updated and changed. So uh, it was really uh, tough to stay on top of what the research was telling us and that kind of gave a lot of fear and uncertainty about the situation. Um, but those sites provided considerably good outcomes for their COVID patients. And um, due to everything shutting down and people staying home, the world was really isolating for all of us, but especially so for the healthcare workers and, and those working uh, with known COVID patients because we uh, kind of felt like pariahs anywhere we went that we could possibly be infected and not know it. And just this sort of guilt and fear of, of not wanting to infect our loved ones. So I think just every day going through the trauma and horror of the pandemic, but unable to be close to our families um, and, and get that like comfort. Um, a lot of people could isolate at home and kind of stay with their family unit, but whereas uh, healthcare workers had to stay separate. And I had a one-year-old uh, during that time and it affected me pretty personally. You know, my wife and son uh, had got COVID. My wife was a nurse at another hospital. And it brings to light this question of, you know, presumptive um, protection, what people were talking about before being provided to people working with known COVID patients, where a lot of the risks were in the other hospitals and the other sites where COVID patients were emerging and you'd find a positive patient on a, on a, a non-COVID unit and then they'd be sent over to the COVID site so, you know, COVID in those months was everywhere. It was in all the hospitals. Um, I'd be curious about the details of the infection rates of the different hospitals and sites so we could kind of zone in on that. Um, and so I've spoken about this topic a little bit when it was when it was being pushed as like the Essential Emergency Workers Relief Act, because the concern was that so many people were taking time off and not being compensated for it. Like in my case, um, I had to be tested for COVID many times. And a lot of times the Department of Health would be recommending a quarantine or, or waiting until the COVID test was negative before coming back to work. In these sort of one or two off shifts of testing, people were not getting compensated. They were using their own paid sick time. Uh, I can speak for my, myself to say that I'm not aware of uh, any hazard pay that was paid out to nurses, nursing assistants, uh, the staff that I worked with throughout this time. Uh, excluding the agency nurses, right? We brought in a lot of nurses out of state that had to be paid premium rates to get them over here. Um, so I can't necessarily speak to those nurses. Another thing to consider is that the COVID hospital has closed, right? These are no longer current employees. They have now moved. So um, just in terms of our tracking and stuff, uh, how to capture those numbers would be a concern since uh, some of those sites have closed and moved around a lot. And they had people from all different kind of systems coming in uh, there for the short term. Um, but I, I also have the concern of leaving behind grocery store workers. And I think we should look back and capture that moment in time of those, those months where we were all very afraid and worried to be out there. And there were those folks that could not work remotely from home. And they were there 
uh, selling food. They were there uh, in, in meatpacking and production warehouses um, where they couldn't have the ability to socially distance, where the PPE uh, requirements were uh, questionable. Um, so, you know, any good nurse knows they can't do it alone. Uh, it took all the workers coming together to make this possible. I think we need to be really prudent about not leaving anyone behind. And uh, please, I just uh, to take a, a thoughtful and meticulous approach to honor all the workers who stepped up and put themselves on the line. Uh, so thanks for your time, and that's all. Thank you so much, Mr. Clute, and thank you for um, doing what you're doing during this pandemic also. I'm just going to give you the rest of the order because maybe I don't know if anybody knows the order that's on remote. So I'll just tell you who's, who's coming up next will be Connie Berger, then it's Carmen Brown, then Etta Souter, then Kelly Hagan, Roberta Young, and Lisa Boulay. So that's the order in case you're wondering if you're sitting there waiting to testify. That's the order. So next up, we've got Connie Berger, a hospital worker, SEIU. Hello, Connie. Welcome to the committee. State your name for the record. Hi, my name is Connie Berger. Um, chair and members of the committee. My name is Connie Berger. I live in New Brighton and I am an x-ray tech at Abbott Northwestern Hospital. I am also a member of SEIU Healthcare Minnesota and was on our negotiating committee with Alina. As an x-ray tech, I spent the last year and a half taking x-rays on patients to help diagnose if they had COVID-19 and to see the extent of the damage. I use a portable x-ray machine that I bring into a room that a patient has been sitting in for hours. For sitting in for hours. So while most everyone else spent 2020 trying to avoid people who might have COVID, I spent that time going into rooms of people we were pretty sure had COVID, rooms they had been filling with their breath often for hours. Hospital workers like myself had to face this virus without adequate PPE. For the first several weeks of the pandemic, I was restricted to one surgical mask. I wore this mask all day for several days in a row. We had some N95 respirators, but we had to treat them like gold and carefully conserve them. We would only wear N95 masks for suspected COVID cases. If a patient had an injury such as a broken ankle, we would wear a surgical mask to conserve our N95s. We were expected to use our N95 until it broke. They usually lasted about a week. I had coworkers who stapled broken straps back on to the respirator to have some protection as replacement masks were not readily available. And as mentioned, yes, they were locked in the manager's offices. Uh, some patients wear surgical or cloth masks to help protect the hospital workers. They knew they were doing their part to reduce the spread of COVID. Other patients would wear a mask, but would pull it down to cough or sneeze and then replace it. Others completely ignored the masking policy, putting patients and workers at risk. When asked, they would refuse to wear a mask and become belligerent. My employer, Alina, provided us with some limited paid leave to use when we had to quarantine for COVID. They did not provide any hazard pay. In fact, the Alina Techs settled a new contract this year. After everything we went through in 2020, Alina insisted on a 0% raise in year one of our current three-year contract. I hope the Minnesota legislature will pay essential workers a bonus to recognize the dangers we faced and the sacrifices we made. Please remember all the hospital workers, including the environmental staff who had to clean the rooms after a contagious patient. Please also remember the firefighters like my husband. Please remember other essential workers like grocery store employees and food workers who helped healthcare workers like me make it through the pandemic. When my spirits were below after a long frustrating day, takeout meals from local restaurants were always there to lift my spirits. The Easter brunch from the exchange in New Brighton may have been the highlight of my year. Thank you for hearing my story. Please make sure the money gets to the frontline workers as soon as possible. Make the hero pay easy to access and match the sacrifice that so many of us have made. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Berger, and thank you for doing what you do during this pandemic and every day. Um, next up, Carmen Brown. I'm not sure if Carmen is there yeah. because it says I am here. 10. Can you see me? Oh, that's you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you're okay. Carmen. Carmen yep. Brown, um, MS1, MST085. Yeah, Carmen that's Brown. nice. It, I don't know why. Name. I had my name in there. It disappeared, so I don't know what happened. All right, state your name for the record. Thanks for coming, Carmen. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Carmen Brown. I am the president of Ask Me Local 977 at Hennepin County Medical Center. Our local represents all of clerical, 
food service workers, environmental service workers, transporters, and health care assistants. We are a proud local of over 1,000 Ask Me Strong members and the largest union at Hennepin County Medical Center. I would like to share with you who we are as frontline essential workers. When you enter the great walls of HCMC, the first person that greets you with that warm smile is a clerical worker. It is a clerical worker who does the initial COVID screening to make sure all of our staff are safe. That consists of giving the patient a mask, taking a quick temp, and asking the COVID screening questions about your exposure to COVID. Now let's move on to our environmental service workers who expose themselves each and every time they enter a patient's room to clean, a room that is contaminated with COVID. They make sure your loved one's room is clean and comfortable. Our transporters, they take your loved ones to their hospital rooms, appointments, and clinic vi visits, and they are also exposed to patients with COVID. The food service workers, they come to deliver a meal, a hot meal, three times a day, pick up the trays and take them back. And they're entering in and out of those patients' rooms who are um, exposed to COVID. Finally, our healthcare assistants who are spending 70% of their shift sitting in the room of COVID patients, monitoring machines, taking temps, blood pressure, et cetera. A known fact here at HCMC, we are currently caring for 425 inpatient beds to date. This does not include the incoming patients today or those coming from the emergency room today. Many of the clerical workers did not receive protective equipment when COVID first hit. We were actually one of the last to receive protective gear, but we were the first face you saw. Many AFSCME members across the state made our masks so our frontline workers could be protected. When some, of, when some of management went home to work, we frontline workers were not given that option. We had to stay and risk catching COVID and exposing our families. One of my coworkers asked me to share how as a healthcare assistant, spending 70% of her shift sitting in a COVID room with a COVID patient, she caught COVID and exposed her elderly grandmother who lived with her. She felt guilty because she got her grandmother caught COVID because of her and questioned should she stay or quit her job. Many of our workers are single working parents who had no daycare, no school for their children and had to make hard choices to work or be a parent to their children. Not to mention the hassle many of our workers endured trying to just get COVID pay for any COVID leave due to exposure by uh, management. We all deserve this pay. Today will be a disservice to tell all frontline essential healthcare workers who put themselves and their families at great risk. It's concerning to me that this is even a question. HCMC 977 members did the work and did not receive bonuses, did not receive hazard pay or any other supplemental pay for this time. Hospitals do not just run with just the doctors and nurses, but it takes a team of all of us to run the hospital. Pay the team. Not one single healthcare worker should be left out. I wanna thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Ms. Brown. Next up, we have Etta Suter, uh, RN, Director of Emergency Services, and Etta Suter. Oh, there she is. Hello. Uh, Welcome to the committee. State your name for the record. My name is Etta Soder, and I am the director of the emergency services at Community Memorial Hospital in Cloquet, Minnesota. When COVID was first being discussed in our nation, I began to think about our hospital immediately and thought, what are we going to do? We are a critical access hospital, which means we have a total of 25 beds in our facility. How are we going to handle a surge of very ill patients? We were at a critical point in healthcare and being told we have to start preparing for the worst. We have to start preparing for such uncertainty. So many questions from all healthcare workers with no exact answers. Imagine the fear instilled. Our RNs will be the front line for patients with this disease we know little about. 
People are literally dying around the world, and now our RNs have to be the bravest they've ever been and continue to honor their oath as a nurse. It started with meetings and questions flying around the room and everyone frenzied about COVID and the fact that we could potentially lose a lot of people in our community. Having guidance from the CDC and MDH, we began to map out plans. I had to get our ED ready for COVID patients and try and think through everything we needed to do to keep everyone safe. I spent countless hours in my office keeping up with every changing process so I could keep my staff informed. I put new updates and processes in a binder so my staff could go to the COVID binder and get caught up quickly. That COVID binder currently has one ream of paper in it. Countless numbers of hours spent rewriting policies and procedures, making sure we had the supplies we needed to protect everyone. My team had to face this head on with no choice. They just knew someone had to take care of our patients. The PPE they had to put on for each patient was exhausting. The masks they had to wear made it difficult to communicate to our patients and their colleagues. And imagine the fear of the patients when a nurse walked in bundled up from head to toe. At the end of their shift, I would see them take off their PPE and their faces reddened from the heat of a long gown, gloves, face mask, protective wear on their heads, and eye goggles. There would be a line indented on their face from having their half mask respirators on for eight to 16 hours a day. They had to face day after day, very ill and dying patients, and then losing a patient and having to take a deep breath and continue this endless battle. They didn't know if they would contact COVID through work or just being out in the community, but you know what? They showed up, they came to work. Colleagues out on quarantine due to exposures or contacting the virus, worrying about their colleagues coming in and working for them, countless hours of overtime, constant daily staffing problems, uncertainty about enough staff to take care of our increased workload, our nurses worrying about bringing the virus home to their families, nurses having to take on different roles throughout the hospital because of all the processes we had to keep everyone safe, dealing with frustrated families because they couldn't be with their family member, constant phone calls that no one had time to answer, daily routines completely turned upside down. Working at the hospital became an environment of fear, worry, anxiety, exhaustion, frustration, and isolation. We no longer were able to sit next to each other. We no longer were able to hug each other. We were no longer able to have a quick bite to eat with each other. We no longer had in-person meetings. Everything was via computer or phone. The isolation was incredible. The fear of contracting the virus every day you worked was overwhelming. Some of my RNs didn't return home for weeks for the fear of bringing it to their families. We had to change our infrastructure in ED and throughout the hospital. We had to lock our doors, manage people through one entrance. We had to find enough masks to put on everyone that entered our building. We were overwhelmed with patients showing up in ED because clinics didn't want to see ill patients coming into their facility. We were overwhelmed with the numerous COVID tests and the availability of those tests and waiting for those results. Our administration supported us by keeping us as informed as they could. They didn't know all the answers, but when they did, they informed us. Our administration set up a COVID task force that met from the beginning and continues to do so now. They all worked to be sure we had all the PPE we needed and supplies to take care of our patients. A resilience committee was initiated and they have come up with different ways to show appreciation to our employees. Our administration fought for us and listened to all of our concerns and supported our ideas and thoughts and remained positive. Most importantly, our administration didn't lay off one employee everyone still has their job and continue to support us. Will we be better prepared for the Delta variant having gone through this? Yes. 
but the emotional and physical anguish will remain the same. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony, uh, Ms. Souter. Um, next up, we have Kelly Hagen from Sanford Health in Bemidji. Welcome to the committee. Kelly, state your name for the record. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Housley, members of the committee and fellow uh, testifiers. My name is Kelly Hagen. I'm Vice President of Nursing and Clinical Services at Sanford Bemidji. We um, have responsibility for a large regional footprint in Northwestern Minnesota. And I'm so happy to be here to talk a little bit about our experience today. And I wanna be the voice for our healthcare workers, all of them, no matter what their position was. Having been a nurse and a nurse leader for many, many years, Healthcare has always brought challenges that our frontline workforce has had to meet head on and to care for our communities, for our patients and for each other. An incremental and continuous magnification of how this pandemic would affect the very existence of all of us was monumental, historic, and in addition to what Mary stated, impactful to everyone. Looking at what it took to be in a constant state of urgency, change and immediate action has been unprecedented. Our frontline healthcare workers stood up to the challenge time and time again, from understanding what we were facing to gaining knowledge and understanding of what we needed to do, tearing apart and rebuilding our workflows and our approach to managing our patients in our community, understanding how much PPE we had, how much we needed, and what do we need to have to protect our staff and our patients. Building and altering our infrastructures, we had to add 42 beds to our already existing number of beds. We had to add countless rooms with negative pressure to, to safely care for our folks, understand how much um, equipment and um, just various supplies that we needed to take care of our patients, how to train and how to use all of this equipment, and how to prov provide the best care and support for our staff on a daily basis. Our whole workforce here undertook upskilling to add the reinforcement to our healthcare workforce that we needed to accomplish all of the work. All of our staff signed up for additional shifts. We identified everybody's talents and abilities and set forth to put a program together to ensure that we could have the competencies in place to train all of our staff in, in quick turnaround. Everybody made personal sacrifice and added hours. These staff had to figure out how to protect their family and how to be away from their family. They had to figure out how to be teachers and yet how to distance from their family. The emotional support that our staff had to provide to our families and patients who had succumbed to COVID or who were in the process of being treated for COVID was unprecedented. The nurse and often our healthcare workers were the only link between a patient and their family time and time again. I can't tell you of those gut-wrenching moments, how impactful they were as we sat on the sidelines, although creating that infrastructure for our staff, watching how those connections were made and the sheer emotion that our staff endured in ensuring our patients and families did stay connected at every opportunity. Resilience and flexibility, signing up, as I said, for those extra shifts were just something that our folks had to figure out. Standing up and um, standing up testing sites, infusion clinics, vaccine clinics, partnering with our community to ensure our schools were as safe as they could be, partnering with health systems across our footprint, uh, partnering with long-term care. None of these folks had any idea how to deal with a pandemic and our folks stood up, took on the challenge and ensured that what we knew and what we could support, we were there for them. And it took many of our staff to be on those front lines with all, with all of those facilities. Compounded by all of this was the healthcare worker shortage. We had folks who really just could not continue to work in their roles, either because of risk or because of complexity. So we lost a lot of folks. We had um, workers come in, the, our um, traveler workers coming in, uh, which then those folks were, although very much appreciated, didn't know our facilities. So it was orientating new folks to the processes that we had. And so we really had challenges beyond challenges. The other added uh, complexity here that I just wanted to bring up is as the pandemic impacted all of our communities, so did it impact behavioral health. And not only did our employees have to stand up all of the things to care for our COVID patients, they also had to endure and manage an incremental number of folks who are experiencing behavioral health issues that continues today. 
And although all of the infrastructure and extra work that we did to create um, the environment to care for all our patients uh, was unprecedented, it certainly has set us up so that we can take care of patients in the future. We know how much effort our staff put into all of the things that we had to accomplish and we would appreciate anything that these folks could have in the um, in, in appreciating them for all that they have done. And so I ask that you all consider how we might be able to uh, provide this um, monetary um, appreciation from our staff for our staff, <clears throat> excuse me, our frontline workforce and uh, and really show them how much we appreciate all that they have done. And I would include everybody uh, in that. Um, I think everybody's mentioned the, the list of folks, and I'm going to leave some out. Our EMTs, our nurses, our aides, all of our support um, uh, services, access, lab, radiology, food services, environmental services, se uh, security, and our um, EBS workers. So thank you, and I appreciate your time today. Thank you, uh, Ms. Hagen. Um, we do really appreciate everything that you've done over the last 20 months. Um, it can't be easy, and I, I, I just want to thank you. You, you are the reason we have this frontline workers group. It, you, you definitely have increased risk of virus exposure due to the nature of your job, and um, you summed it up there well. So thank you very much, Ms. Hagen. Um, next, we have thank Roberta. you. I appreciate the time. Yep, we have um, Roberta Young from Lake Region Hospital on MHA. Welcome to the committee, Roberta. State your name for the record. Thank you. My name is Roberta Young, and I really appreciate having this moment um, with you to advocate um, from where I stand in the hospital I work in. So I'm a nurse leader at Lake Region Hospital in Fergus Falls, Minnesota. We're a 105-bed um, PPS hospital um, and serve uh, approximately five different counties um, within West Central Minnesota. And I want to thank you for this opportunity to testify about the workforce and how we can advocate for the care of the caregiver with these funds. My career as a nurse spans over 40 years, and I have encountered many a crisis, many a different varied things in this great uh, career. I love being a nurse, but none has really exceeded the high level of persistent energy, gut-wrenching decisions, tireless explanations, and reassurance of the communities that we serve then um, that has been COVID. I, it's unprecedented, and I know that's a word that's probably been overused, but I don't know how else to describe it. And now at a time that we had hope that we were really beating COVID to a manageable, safe, tried and true processes, there's a resurgent. And so once again, we're learning. You know, nurses, I'll leave out some folks too, I don't mean to, but nurses, respiratory therapists, providers, all of our great support staff um, had, do not have the same reserves that we had over 18 months ago. And we're at the same time, we're called to rise to these new developments, the capacity demands that we're facing. And we have a smaller workforce now to meet this resurgence. We have a higher vacancy rate than we've ever seen before in our nurses. And I talked to my colleagues across the state, small hospitals, large hospitals are seeing um, the, the effects of our slim workforce and the increased use of travelers. That just does not make the same culture um, that we need. Um, so we have a higher vacancy rate. At the same time, we're seeing increased demand um, for our services. The extra cost of recruiting, using traveler staff, and at times working at not optimal staffing levels adds to the anxiety and to the culture. And I will say any of us that when we, our anxiety is high, um, we're not feeling safe, our decision-making is not on point. Um, uh, for the patients and the communities we serve, we need on-point healthcare providers. I want my colleagues to be restored in a way that's meaningful and also keeps them available to the workforce. As a leader, we can provide for, we have provided for extra staffing support. We've hired temporary folks. We've called in different retired people to come back and work with us. We've looked at training, being cons making sure that we have very consistent, frequent um, communication. You've heard some of our frontline nurses talk about, you know, how distressing it was to have a policy one way at the beginning of your shift and another way at the end because we learned new information. It just makes you feel like, am I really doing the right thing and who wants to work under those conditions? And unfortunately, with the evolution of COVID and how we're learning about it, that was the case. So we have to be really on point with our communication and really making sure that 
the folks who needed it had the right information and the right support to do their jobs. We know that things like easy access to testing for our staff, easy access to vaccines for our staff were really important and wanted to make sure that they knew those things and had availability um, for that, that part of it. We wanted to create an environment where the, we can learn and honor from those frontline caregivers who knew exactly what to do and exactly what we needed to change from a support and administration level. We wanted to honor nurses who have given so much and all of our care providers who have given so much. While these are worthwhile efforts in terms of what we have done from administration and leadership is probably not enough, and we know it's not enough. We need and want to provide more tangible ways to recognize the extraordinary output of heart, of healing, and of expertise to the communities that we're privileged to serve. I'm advocating for hospital clinical workers and to be a part of this, that are caring for communities and I would say in very creative and exceptional ways to be included in a hero payer or bonus program. This can help keep our expert staff in the workforce. This is so needed right now. It may also help ease other anxieties I have because all of our care workers are whole people. Um, you heard stories about that they also are caring for their families and they're caring for loved ones. They may um, they have other folks that they're responsible for. We're whole people. It's not all about work. And, but at work, what can we do and what can we ease for them? They're whole people who have uh, balanced care for loved ones at home and a very demanding workforce, a demanding profession. This is one way that we have to show compassion for our caregivers, and I advocate that we do that. Thank you for allowing me the time to advocate for this great staff. And um, I really do appreciate this opportunity and appreciate, again, the resources that you're working with and um, the time that you're taking to listen. It's much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Young, for your testimony. We really do appreciate it. And um, you had some really good points in, in your testimony. Uh, so thank you. Oh, yes, yes, Senator Murphy. Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, thank you, um, Ms. Young, for uh, your testimony, uh, and it, much of it uh, rings true uh, to me. When I first practiced nursing, I worked in a rural hospital in the middle of Wisconsin, and the nurses and staff that worked in that hospital came from uh, a broad surrounding area, um, a lot of little communities around uh, Marshfield, which was a, also a small community. Uh, and when there was a snowstorm, uh, often it meant that the people who lived in the further out surrounding areas could not get to work. And so those who were staffing the hospital had to stay until they could be replaced. And so that meant that, you know, sometimes you were there much longer than you anticipated, especially if you lived in Marshfield, which I did. Um, that was a temporary problem. It didn't last very long. The plows would come or people would get their trucks out and off the farm and into work. Uh, so I think about that temporary issue and then listening to you talking about the experience that you've had over these many, many months and now facing a surge again. And the tools that you can use as a nurse leader to not just only reward, but to keep people at work. So, um, you know, Senator Kipmeyer is right. Um, she's a nurse, I'm a nurse. You come to this work because you care about people. You feel an obligation, not just for the patients in your care, but also for your fellow workers, and you'll stand in for them. But when you get to your limits, um, and when your workforce gets to its limits, I know that there are tools like bonuses um, and other means that help financially uh, to, get, to keep people in that space. One piece of testimony I heard earlier this year from another hospital employee was because of the pressures of the pandemic um, and quarantine. Um, he had to use all of his leave time um, to be able to quarantine and take care of his family. So as we got to the part of the pandemic uh, that uh, where we thought there was the light at the end of the tunnel and people were starting to be able to come back to normal life, uh, his friends were saying to him, no, well, now you get to take a break. Um, and that's great. And you should take a vacation. And he said, I don't have any time left. I don't have any leave time left. I had to use it during the course of this. So when you think about a spent workforce and a depleted workforce who's leaving um, their work uh, and there's not a lot of leave time um, to refill their cups, 
Uh, I am wondering what strategies uh, you and your colleagues are using uh, in that situation, especially now uh, as we're seeing an increase in population and acute illness as it, rel as, as it relates to the Delta variant. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that we have, Yen. Um, can I, Ms. Yen, can I go ahead and, and answer this or? Sure, sure, briefly. You, excuse me. Thank you. But in just for a minute, I need to tell, I want to testify and I have to get to appointment by two o'clock. Okay, let's, um, we'll go straight to um, Ms. Belay, uh, if that's okay, because we just Thank you. Okay, go ahead, Ms. Belay from. Um, okay, my name's Lisa Belay. I'm from Bemidji, Minnesota. I am an ASME member, but I am testifying on my own behalf. ASME did not ask me to do this or anything. I work at the Bemidji Community Behavior Health Hospital, Bemidji CBHH. There are also, I think, five other sister hospitals in the network. We are a 16-bed inpatient behavioral health unit. When we first opened up, we had a lot of people. We truly were a community hospital and had a lot of people who were just on 72-hour holds or having a mental health crisis. Well, now we receive people from and throughout the pandemic, received people throughout the state who are on mental health commitments. These are people who are chronically ill. When we first opened, um, oh, as a human service technician, I should say what I do. It's for you nurses, it's basically a nursing assistant job. But when our patients were admitted, they were not tested for COVID. They were kind of screened, but if patients didn't want their temperature taken, we couldn't force them. Um, staff was very concerned, like every place else, we did have problems with PPE. But as a human service technician, myself and my coworkers, we were up close with patients. Our patients did not wear masks. We could not have them wear masks. They, we could not require them to wear masks. Um, even if there was somebody who they thought was COVID, we could not make them stay in their room. They, could, they did not social distance. Um, our RNs were dedicated, but most of the RNs spent very little time with patients. Our social workers and doctors did not see patients except through a computer screen. The LPNs worked very hard too, but they most of the time were spent in the med room. I and my coworkers were out on the floor wondering what do we have here? Um, sometimes we were scared. We had patients then who they thought might have it, so they tested them for COVID. Well, while they're waiting, and this was when the test took you know days to come back. So we were standing outside the room in full PPE telling them, please don't come out of their room. If they did come out of their room, we are just supposed to follow them around and wipe up everything we touched. Um, we did a lot of forced overtime. Um, it's just, people were scared. Um, some of my coworkers took um, COVID leave and got paid for it because they said they didn't feel safe. I. We'll say, yes, there are people who, does, who are more um, at risk of exposure than we were, but there are a lot of people who are a lot less. Um, people I know who work at grocery stores and Target, they got bonuses. They had the plexiglass spit screens. We had nothing like that. Um, I'm just asking you to please consider us for some of this bonus money. We do not have the opportunity to um, earn bonuses or merit pay. Um, I know there's not much money there when it comes down to it. And when somebody says, well, it needs to be a significant amount. Well, you know, sure, I would love to get $1,500. And I think I deserve $1,500. But I'd rather get $200 than nothing. At least if I got 200 bucks, I could go pay my cell phone bill or something. Um, actually, really what happen, needs to happen is the legislature needs to add more money to this. If I would have been on unemployment, I would have made half my wages, plus first it was like a 
$600 kicker a week, then a $500 kicker a week, and now it's just a pity little $300 a week. But myself and my coworkers, we would have made more money on unemployment. So please consider us for this money. Um, we were right, you know, right up there. We still are. We're dedicated workers, and I don't know what else to say, but is I feel that I've been abandoned by the state of Minnesota. Um, so thank you for your time, and um, Senator Murphy, Murphy and um, Guy, I forgot your name. You're also a nurse. Senator Kibmeyer, you're nurses. You understand what we're going through. So thank you very much, committee members, and have a good day. Thank you so much, Ms. Boulay, and thank you for hanging in there. Um, I know you've been in your car two hours just waiting. Yeah. Um, so thank you very, very much for your testimony. And it has uh, been hard on all of you listening to these stories, how, how tired and the anxiety and, and fear, and you all push through. And, and I can't imagine what your families have gone through. And you're also taking care of your kids or your parents, your spouses. We heard that story. Um, it's been really, really tough. And now with surge number four coming along, um, Whew, um, you truly are our heroes, and, and we do need to do something here at the legislature. And I don't know if, um, Roberta, if you can answer Senator Murphy's question quickly, just because we're at the, the, the bell point, um, and then we'll talk about what we're going to do next week. So go ahead, Roberta. Just one, I'll just briefly talk about one strategy that we did, is that we did have the um, wherewithal to increase the number of hours people could carry in their banks so they would not get that and really kept a close eye on who um, running, you know, running the reports so we knew who was at the close to the um, not having enough of that PTO or paid time off to do that is one strategy that was used within our health system. I'm sure there's, there's several others. Certainly was a concern. Um, also when we were short staffed or when we were not seeing patients um, and we are a short staff because of quarantines. Uh, people were not, there was a problem last summer, people not getting their vacations and we had shortened vacations so they were able to save. So we've been very intentional this summer about really making sure that people get their time off that they deserve. So thank you for the question. Thank you, Ms. Young. Um, with that, I'm gonna toss it over to Representative Winkler. I didn't give you a heads up on that, but if you wanna talk about uh, what we'll be doing on Thursday. Sure, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you to all the testifiers, once again, for presenting powerful information and uh, reminding us how important it is that we get this right as best we can. On Thursday, if you remember last week, we talked about trying to develop criteria where each member would bring the working group would bring in uh, a draft of what they think criteria we should use for evaluating these. And so I'd like to have a discussion with that. Homework is due Thursday. And I will call on everybody to, I won't do it law school style where I'm gonna surprise you and ask you random questions, but um, uh, if people could come prepared to discuss criteria that we may wanna use, I think that will help us. We will also hear from uh, Department of Revenue on payment options and I hope uh, that we will hear from the children's cabinet as well as uh, testimony from uh, workers in child care because we need to uh, dig into that a little bit deeper. Uh, for next week, uh, in brief conversation with you, uh, Madam Chair, we talked about uh, moving to a fully remote a uh, couple of hearings. I will be out of town. I think you were going to be out of town. We're having uh, members who are, uh, I think, needing a little bit of uh, time here and there. So. I think next week we will probably be fully remote, uh, but we will provide more details on that as we go ahead. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, and next week, Tuesday, we will have the state of Louisiana testifying about what they will be doing. Senator Kiffmeyer. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Say, so, um, one of the things I know, we've looked at some other states in regards to ways in which they were doing this. I think there was a presentation or something but one that I'm really interested in hearing from, I think Louisiana had a pretty different approach than maybe some of the others. I'd really like to either hear directly from any of their state Senator officials. Kirchner, they're going to be here next Tuesday. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Next yeah. week. Next week, Tuesday, Louisiana will be virtual, but yes. 
with sometimes what with saying. guys with those masks, it isn't always. Especially <laughs> if you don't speak right into your microphone. I I missed no, that's quite a few I'll... things. I'm sorry. It's I appreciate all that, but yeah, thank you. Okay, so we'll hear that next week. My one concern, though, is that if we hear that next week, we're also talking about bringing lists on Thursday. I'd really like to hear about Louisiana first, if we could. Um. Well, you know, Senator Kiffmeyer, maybe we'll just have, we'll do, you'll require more homework for the next Thursday also after we hear Louisiana. We'll bring what we have for this Thursday, and then we can always tweak it going forward. Um, yeah, they were supposed to be here today, um, but they had a conflict, so they just changed it to next Tuesday. Okay, good. All right, well, so whatever the main thing we is, bring. I don't know that I would want to, I want to have the full amount of information before starting to come to conclusions. So to narrow it down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Madam Chair, Mr. Senator Kiffmeyer, I wonder if maybe we can just start that conversation because I think we do need to start trying to, you know, get a little bit more concrete. So instead of thinking of it as narrowing down on Thursday, maybe we'll, we'll think of it as laying out a menu of criteria that we could use and then refine that that conversation as we go forward. Mm -hmm. Rep or Senator Kiffmeyer. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think that concept of uh, criteria, because it seems like uh, when you look at things that we're going to do, that that really is a driver, you might say, and especially with both federal rules and state law to be consistent with that, I, I think that would be very helpful. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Doty has a question. Commissioner Doty, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to mention that um, it is our intention uh, on Thursday to to also cover a little bit about the Louisiana program as well. Um, we'll put that, that's, I'm factoring that into our presentation. So hopefully that will also help uh, with Senator Kiffmeyer's concern. Great, thank you so mm -hmm. much. Um, again, I wanna thank all of the testifiers for your very personal stories, um, some difficult stories. Uh, for sharing them with us and um, we will all keep that with us when we're making our decision going forward uh, with that folks we will adjourn until next thursday thank you recording stopped